Well, I partially am. This is not bad. So, yeah. It's kind of all I do. We have, we have these as well. But. Okay. And does this work? Oh, okay. Hi. Um, can you all hear me? No. Nope. <laughs> I said that super quiet. Hi, everybody. Is that better? All right. Um, thank you, everyone, for being here tonight for this panel discussion. Um, my name is Shali Gupta Barnes. I'm with the Cairo Center for Religions, Rights, and Social Justice. And we're here with Dr. Michael Hudson, um, Reverend Dr. Liz Theo Harris, and Dr. Al Yun Yang to talk about the history of debt and the Bible and its lessons for today. Um, Dr. Hudson, as many of you may know, is a renowned economist and scholar who has written extensively about how the economy really works um, in his book. Uh, you can see it in his book, J is for Junk Economics, The Bubble and the Beyond, and Killing the Host. And he comes out of a pretty radical past, although at one point he was also the high, one of the highest paid economists on Wall Street. Um, and has been an advisor to governments around the world. And over the course of several years, Dr. Hudson has taken on a study of long-term economic trends from antiquity to the present. Um, this is the basis of his latest work, and forgive him, uh, and forgive us our debts. Um, this looks at the long history of debt forgiveness and release from debt bondage. And when I say long history, it is really a long history that we are looking at that really has not been looked at in this way before. From the Mesopotamia, from, from Mesopotamia through Babylon and um, the prophets through Egypt, then the Greek and Roman empires, to Jesus' teachings and later uh, Byzantium and Constantine, Dr. Hudson traces the evolution of private property and class structure through the, relation through the history of debt relationships. This is not just a study of political economy, but also a study of, co study of cosmology and theology. And out of this research that brings together the discrete fields of Assyriology, um, biblical study, economics, and more, he calls upon us to question what we know and accept about our economy today. As he summarizes in this long history, debts that can't be paid won't be paid, and for many, um, you know, for many centuries, it was uh, understood and agreed to that they shouldn't be paid. Um, in our economy today, where contemporary debt crisis has more than one in five households in this country underwater, that is, they owe more than they own, um, and we are, you know, seeing 140 million people and more in this country who are suffering from poverty and low wages, just one paycheck or emergency away above the poverty line, um, and increasingly, therefore, finding themselves in debt, whether it's through payday loans, credit card debt, mortgage, you know, mortgage crisis that we're still reeling from, um, it's clear that this history of debt is increasingly relevant and necessary to our understanding of the economy and its pressure points uh, today. We also have with us Reverend Dr. Liz Theo Harris, Director of the Cairo Center and National Co-Chair of the Poor People's Campaign, A National Call for Moral Revival. She's also a biblical scholar and anti-poverty activist, organizer and political educator for more than two decades. And Dr. Ali Yu Nyang from Union Theological Seminary. Dr. Nyang is a New Testament scholar and theologian whose work has focused on faith and freedom in Paul and Galatians and 1 Corinthians and often making connections across time and space to his native West Africa. So tonight we'll hear from uh, Dr. Hudson first, then from um, our two respondents, and then we'll return to Dr. Hudson before opening up for some Q&A. All right, uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Hudson uh, to open up tonight's lecture. This is the second time uh, that I've appeared with Shaley Barnes and uh, Liz Theodorakis, uh, so I'm very glad uh, 
to be here again with them. Uh, in the 1960s, I was teaching uh, uh, economics uh, at the New School for Social Research. Uh, I stopped teaching economics because I couldn't fit uh, anything that I was interested in into the economics curriculum. Uh, they didn't want to teach economic history. Uh, they didn't want to teach the history of economic thought, uh, unless uh, Professor Halbrunner could do it. And especially, they didn't want to teach uh, money and banking. Uh, that uh, uh, led me to uh, leave uh, academia and to become a futurist, working with uh, the Hudson Institute and then uh, other uh, in, uh, futures institutes uh, as consultants for uh, governments, uh, corporations, and others. And uh, then I became an economist for the United Nations. Uh, UNITAR, the uh, United Nations Institute for Training and Research. And uh, my field was basically third world debt uh, and the fact that it couldn't be paid. Uh, in the early 60s, I was the balance of payments economist for Chase Manhattan Bank. Uh, and my job was to calculate how large a trade and payment surplus uh, the Latin American countries uh, could generate with the idea that uh, how much can they borrow so that all of their money, their entire surplus, could be paid to the bank? And my job was to see how much the surplus could be to make sure that they didn't get any, any of it, that the uh, international bankers uh, got it. So it was obvious that uh, already in the mid-60s, they couldn't afford to borrow anymore because the surplus was already completely taken up. Uh, so I gave a speech in Mexico, uh, uh, the UNITAR meeting, uh, saying that the third world debt couldn't be paid. There was a, uh, a riot. Uh, they said it's unthinkable that debts cannot be paid. Uh, it's necessary, if you don't pay the debts, then you're going to have a, uh, uh, an economic collapse. So I put everything aside and I began in the 1980s uh, to switch uh, to begin a history of uh, debt cancellations and how different economies through history had handled the situation when uh, the debts were so large that they couldn't be paid. Uh, and it took me about a year to get uh, back uh, through uh, medieval Europe, uh, Greece, and Rome, uh, and uh, the biblical times. And then I found traces of uh, debt cancellations in the uh, ancient Near East in Babylonia. And so I uh, basically switched from being a futurist to being an archaeologist. I joined uh, the, uh, the Peabody Museum at uh, Harvard University in the, in the anthropology department, specifically the archaeology department. And uh, to make a long story short, we uh, decided to begin writing an economic history of the origins of civilization in the ancient Near East and the classical antiquity. Nobody had ever done this before. Uh, and if you look through any of the books that were on Sumer, Babylonia, uh, even Egypt, uh, you wouldn't find uh, any real description of debt. Sometimes you'd see it, uh, sometimes you'd uh, uh, just have to turn the pages of the journals to find it. So uh, the result was that I uh, ended up uh, uh, not only organizing a group to uh, write uh, the economic history and financial history of uh, Sumer, Babylonia, Egypt, and their surrounding regions, but I had to get into biblical history. And what I found was that uh, what the Assyriologists and the archaeologists and even the uh, main biblical historians found was uh, absolutely anathema to all of the vested interests in the theology schools. Uh, and I'll tell you how the uh, idea of what uh, the Bible is all about has been transformed since the 1950s. Uh, as you probably know, in the 1950s, the Dead Sea Scrolls were uh, found uh, uh, in, in a cave. Uh, the, people began to translate them, and uh, they thought, these cannot be real Jewish scrolls. Uh, they must be some strange cult. Let's call them the Essenes. Uh, let's say they were some strange uh, 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 group because it just doesn't seem to fit in with uh, what, what uh, we know. And, and you know, if you go to, if you want to find out what the Bible says, you go to the museum in Washington and you see uh, uh, human beings walking around with dinosaurs, just like uh, the Bible says, and uh, the literal translation of the Bible. Uh, uh, what they don't 
uh, have is any of the uh, anything having uh, to do with finance. Well, at any rate, uh, subsequent research, uh, including uh, by uh, people in uh, the Skirball School at uh, New York University, uh, Larry Schiffman has written a whole study of uh, Melchizedek, uh, uh, who was featured in the scrolls. And uh, what these scrolls show is uh, uh, you'll have like a midrash, which is a collection of all of uh, the, uh, the Jewish Bible's uh, statements on debt cancellation. And it is all interwoven throughout the uh, Jewish Bible, through the prophets, through Isaiah, through Deut Deuteronomy, and of course uh, Leviticus 25, which is all about the Jubilee year. So uh, it's obvious that uh, 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 this was uh, not a sectarian uh, library that was found. This was the official library of the Temple of Jerusalem that was sent to the caves for safekeeping when the Romans were coming and uh, were trying to uh, just uh, devastate and loot uh, the uh, temples as they were doing throughout uh, Asia Minor and throughout uh, the empire. So that was the first uh, sort of uh, revelation that people found. Uh, the second revelation was uh, in uh, England, there was uh, a school of uh, biblical redactors who were trying to go over the language of the Bible to see when was it written and what were the changes and how do you, how, how were all the pieces of the Bible put together into a whole uh, manuscript? And uh, it was discovered that really the Bible was written by the people who, uh, the returnees from uh, what's called the Babylonian captivity. Uh, uh, when the uh, leading uh, Jewish families uh, were uh, kept, uh, lost uh, the war that uh, the biblical prophet said you're going to lose first to Assyria, then to Babylon because you're not uh, a proper society, you're not canceling the debts, you're not helping uh, uh, the poor, uh, you know, you're going to uh, fall apart and that's what happens when uh, you alienate most of society. Either they leave or you're conquered by somebody who offers a better deal. And we know from uh, uh, the Neo-Assyrian Empire was can uh, had regular debt cancellations, the, uh, and I'll go into those later, uh, the rulers would cancel the debts to make sure that uh, the population could stay on the land and be self-supporting, and therefore, being self-supporting, they could serve in the army as soldiers, and they could uh, provide corvée labor to build uh, the walls, to build the palaces, to build the infrastructure. So uh, you had that as a second biblical uh, discussion. Uh, the third uh, uh, major uh, factor leading to the reconsideration of the Bible was uh, Assyriology and the, the f uh, discovery uh, that only has been taking place since the uh, really the 70s and uh, 80s, uh, translating uh, the inscriptions that were left by Hammurabi and other members of the Babylonian dynasty and the Sumerian rulers, such as uh, Rukagina and Metina, uh, uh, most of those, and they found that every, it was normal throughout the Near East on every society, when a new ruler would take the throne, the first thing they would do would uh, proclaim an amnesty. The prisoners would be let out, the debts would be canceled, the taxes would be canceled. Most debts were taxes, uh, but also all the debts that people uh, owed would be uh, basically would be wiped out so that the new ruler's reign could start with everybody in balance, everybody being self-sufficient and self-supporting so that they could uh, operate in a society that was pretty carefully structured, and the structure of Sumer, Babylonia, every uh, Bronze Age society was based on you need families to produce their own food, to produce their own means of uh, uh, living, their own basic needs, uh, and uh, we're, the way that property, since the Neolithic was assigned, uh, you'd have uh, people, either the palace or the temple, was calculating how much land do you give somebody? How do you decide who gets how much land? Well, uh, th they made a calculation. You need so much land and, uh, to provide enough crop to feed your family. Uh, and so for every person, that uh, adult male that you have, that can serve in the army, and for every family that can work on corvée labor to build the uh, uh, infrastructure we have, you'll get X amount of land. Uh, so everybody was assigned a plot so that they could 
uh, play their social role. So taxes came first, then property. Property was a function, a byproduct of uh, the tax liability. Uh, they didn't call them taxes, uh, they just called them public duties. Uh, and we actually have, uh, from Egypt, from uh, Babylonia, uh, from Sumer, we have other records of uh, how they fed these people when they were uh, working uh, on building pyramids, uh, building uh, infrastructure, and uh, you may know from the old Hollywood movies and from uh, television, there is an illusion that the pyramids uh, were built by slaves and uh, that somehow Babylonia uh, all these countries that they were all slave labor. They weren't slave labor. They were, these were the normal citizens, and the fact is uh, that if you look at how do people uh, eat? How do they get meat, for instance? Well, if you have your own plot of land and you're feeding yourself, you're not going to kill your cow to have meat. Uh, the main meat distributions were at these public gatherings where they were building infrastructure, and uh, basically it was a long beer party. You didn't want to drink water, because as any Englishman knows, the water isn't very uh, uh, safe to drink. Uh, beer is much uh, more sanitary. And uh, there were immense amounts of beer. It was, this was a socialization process, basically. Uh, it was uh, people worked together. Uh, there was sort of jobs uh, for everybody building. Uh, they were extremely well fed. Uh, uh, we now know. Uh, the picture is very different from uh, Cecil B. DeMille's uh, uh, sort of version of uh, how it was. So what we found is that, uh, especially in Babylonia, when uh, in around 1750 BC, a Hammurabi, like every other uh, member of his dynasty for hundreds of years, began his reign by proclaiming a clean slate, and that was called Andararam. Uh, and uh, this was uh, the same word that uh, you'd have in Hebrew is Duror, their cognate, Duror Andararam. And uh, the, uh, from Hammurabi all the way down to his great-great-great-grandson, Ami Sadaka, uh, the, uh, these proclamations had three parts. Uh, the first, you would uh, free the uh, bond servants. If somebody owed money to a uh, uh, creditor and had to work it off, uh, either by going to work in his fields or uh, living at his house, they'd be freed. Second, you would annul the debts. Nobody had any debts so that everybody could begin to pay uh, taxes and work on infrastructure again. And third, if anyone had pledged land, borrowed against the land rights, the land would be restored to them. Uh, so we have this happening. Uh, not only uh, were there uh, legal uh, law cases where landlords tried to get around this and creditors tried to get around this, uh, but you had uh, each uh, ruler after Hammurabi would uh, try to close all of the loopholes that the uh, uh, creditors uh, would try to get. So we know that uh, actually these were the only uh, laws that actually were enforced in Babylonia. Many of, of you may have heard of what they call Hammurabi's law code. Uh, it wasn't a law code, it was a set of, uh, of rules for relations between the palace and the rest of the economy. Uh, these laws uh, were more of a literary character, but were not enforced. The uh, clean slates, the Andararam Act, the debt cancellations, uh, were enforced. Uh, and now we get to the, uh, the fourth factor that is uh, factored into uh, the biblical history, and that is how did uh, this uh, Babylonian practice that was also followed in Assyria, uh, in Egypt you have the said uh, festival of the pharaohs uh, 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 doing it, and many of you may have heard of the Rosetta Stone. Everybody's, a lot of you have heard of the Rosetta Stone. My guess is that none of you, unless you've read my books, uh, know what it actually says. And it's a, a, a debt cancellation uh, for the tax. Uh, and uh, the inscription says, uh, although the, the pharaoh's a Greek and you know, doesn't really know much about Egypt, uh, he's a, a only 14 years old or so, but we've uh, told him how to act like a pharaoh and you have to uh, have an am a debt amnesty to make everything in balance. That's what the uh, Rosetta Stone uh, actually says. So uh, you may wonder why everybody knows that there is a Rosetta Stone in three languages and nobody knows what it says. Uh, the, and the reason is that uh, in almost every book that I was uh, reading when I began Again, my economic history in the 1980s said all these acts are fictitious. It couldn't really have happened that way. Uh, it's not what we would have done. 
Uh, and if not what we would have done, then how could it possibly work? Uh, well, uh, what uh, happened, what we found is putting all these factors together, what the Babylonian uh, am underarm was, is that uh, we found that when uh, the leading uh, Jewish families who had been exiled to Babylonia finally returned, these were not all the Jews that returned. The Bible says they all returned, but we know because we have all the cuneiform records of the families that stayed in Babylonia, uh, they assimilated, uh, we have their marriage records, their, their, uh, the money they, uh, their wills, uh, their uh, economic transactions. We know that they became regular Babylonians. Uh, but the, uh, the wealthiest families came back and, uh, under Ezra and Nehemiah. And uh, you can imagine there was somewhat of an argument uh, when they got back and said, uh, we're back. Uh, give us back our land. You know, basically, uh, get off our land. Uh, this may... Uh, and by the way, give us the temple too. We brought back all of the temple uh, implements. Uh, my colleague and co-editor for the first uh, two volumes of our... Uh, the Harvard uh, uh, colloquia that we did was uh, Baruch Levine, who was one of the leading uh, Hebraic uh, rabbis, uh, both in Israel and the United States. He was also teaching at the Skirball School, and uh, we convened uh, the conferences. And uh, I think it could only have been uh, a leading rabbi who would have been able to, uh, uh, to say, uh, we're back and <laughs> get off our land, you Palestinians, uh, basically. Uh, we don't know what happened after that, because there was a a long, uh, uh, the, the, uh, in Israel, they didn't keep records on uh, ta uh, clay tablets, uh, which last a long time. Uh, and uh, they were kept them on papyrus or whatever they were writing on. Uh, we don't have records of them. So we don't know very much of what happened after the return, after they uh, reconstructed the Bible, after they wrote this dead, rewrote or interjected this debt cancellation into the very origins of Israel and uh, the, uh, their question, if, if you believed in debt cancellation, how do you get it uh, in a society that has become ruled by kings when the kings aren't like they were in the Bronze Age? Uh, the Bronze Age kings uh, still had a kind of economic uh, model. They were called, uh, uh, sort of represent, thought of themselves as representative of uh, uh, their gods, but uh, in the first millennium, the kings were pretty bad. They were all sort of co-opted. They're sort of like the Democratic Party became after 2008. Uh, they were taken over by Wall Street, to make a, uh, uh, an analogy. And uh, if you find, if you read the, Bible, the Jewish Bible, you find that uh, they don't have very many kings that were very nice. Uh, you have Josiah, who was very good, but uh, uh, the, uh, what they say about Solomon, what they say about uh, David, uh, what they say about Ahab was uh, that they were so self-seeking, so uh, uh, avaricious in supporting the wealthy classes that uh, Israel withdrew. And they said, we don't have any stake in the sons of Jesse, Jesse being the mother of David, uh, you know, and uh, they just uh, withdrew. Uh, to form uh, their own society and there disappears from uh, the Bible. Those are the so-called ten lost uh, tribes of Israel. Uh, and the prophets were basically the people who were picking up independently apparently the idea that uh, if you uh, put, if you monopolize real estate, if you put land to land, plot to plot, and house to house, you, uh, and you gentrify the neighborhood, you're not going to have any people in it anymore. Uh, and uh, that was uh, their message. And uh, uh, when Jesus uh, went into the temple uh, in his home uh, town, which uh, Luke 4 describes, what does he do? He unrolls the scroll of Isaiah. Uh, and uh, reads it uh, that he's proclaimed, come to proclaim the year of the Lord. Now, the year of the Lord was one of the uh, 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 the uh, uh, signs of that meant the Jubilee year. The word gospel meant literally good news. The good news was specifically there's going to be a debt cancellation. You can see how all of these sort of term terms spread and. Uh, 
uh, what uh, Jesus is trying to do turns out, now that we have the Dead Sea Scrolls, to be what a very large uh, group of people uh, throughout uh, Judea uh, were all advocating. They said, look, we're falling into debt to the landlords. Uh, we've got to uh, have uh, what the, the Bible says that's placed right in the center of uh, the Mosaic law. Uh, because the redactors of the Bible didn't have a king saying, uh, if kings are good, they're going to cancel the debts. That's like saying, if you vote for the Democratic Party, he's going to help you uh, in the election. Uh, they knew that the kings weren't going to do something that was going to be very good. Uh, and so they, say, they said, it has to be put at the very center of our religion. Uh, and that was the center of Jewish religion uh, for many years, until gradually, as you can imagine, uh, what you could call the Wall Street faction uh, uh, began to uh, try to say, well, we're the Harvard University of Israel. We're going to be the, uh, uh, the economics department. And uh, they sort of founded, uh, the, the Pharisees founded the rabbinical school, which uh, uh, Luke, right after he describes uh, Jesus's, uh, what Jesus said, uh, the population didn't like Jesus, they wanted him to leave town. And uh, Luke said, the Pharisees loved money, they didn't love Jesus. Uh, and you could say that that's been the case for much of the uh, uh, history of the Bible that's been written uh, ever since uh, that time, that uh, the subsequent uh, histories of the Bible uh, were trying to, uh, gradually, there was a fight to make the Bible in the hands of the people. It, uh, for many centuries, the Bible was kept in the hands of people who could read it in uh, uh, Hebrew or Latin or Greek, but it couldn't be translated into the vernacular. Once finally it began to be, to be translated into German under Martin Luther, uh, un, under Eng, into English and other languages, the question is, how do you, what do these words mean? We know what they are, we can read them, and we can pronounce the words, but what do they mean? And uh, uh, you, uh, one of the key elements was uh, the Lord's Prayer, uh, which said, forgive us our, well, forgive us our what? Uh, the uh, English said, forgive us our sins. Uh, in other words, be like Vice President Pence would want you to be. But uh, the word uh, actually connoted, forgive us our debts. And the, uh, in every language, from, the Indi from uh, German, schuld means sin and debt, to French, devoir, to uh, Babylonian, to Hebrew, every single language, the word for sin and debt is the same. And the reason is very simple. If you would uh, c uh, injure somebody, if you would do something that was wrong and you'd hurt somebody, how do you prevent uh, the countries from feuding with each other? How do you fight, how do you prevent retaliation and then everybody looks like a, a, a southern uh, uh, the McCoys and Hatfield? Uh, the answer is uh, you would uh, pay reparations. You would uh, make a payment. So the payment was the flip side of the coin to the offense. You have the same rule in uh, uh, Irish law, uh, in the Brian laws of Ireland. You have the same law throughout uh, um, the Native American uh, societies. Almost every society has this payment of reparation in order to make things even. So nobody has been injured by somebody and there's a resentment. The whole idea of early society was to prevent uh, resentment. Uh, and uh, the, the, at the time, uh, it's easy for someone to say, uh, for, forgive us our sins, uh, but when you say forgive us our debts, all of a sudden that uh, threatens somebody's interest, uh, and specifically the interest of the creditors to whom the debts are owed. And the important thing to understand about debts is one person's debt is another person's saving. Uh, and that's really the problem. Uh, throughout Greece and Rome, you had something very parallel to what was happening uh, in Judea. Uh, you had in the very century in Rome, uh, advocates of debt cancellation, such as uh, uh, Catiline uh, being, being murdered. You had the supporter, every supporter for hundreds of years in Rome who would take the side of the plebs against the creditors was killed. 
I mean, the history of Rome is one great story of assassination of the popular leaders by the oligarchy to prevent uh, there being any kind of debt cancellation. In uh, 88 BC, uh, Rome uh, went to war in Asia Minor, uh, which is uh, now the east side of the Mediterranean, north of uh, 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 Palestine uh, and Syria. And uh, uh, there was an uprising and a, a, Tens of thousands of, uh, basically, the whole population rose up over thousands of square miles. They killed every uh, Roman creditor and tax collector there. That was their protest. Uh, uh, they said there's only one way to get rid of uh, uh, the, the debt cancelers, the, uh, the creditors, and that, uh, that was the way. And that led to uh, the bloodiest war in Roman history. Uh, and it led to all of the temples being looted by Rome. So what was happening in Judea was happening in Rome. Uh, and the philosophy of uh, what Jesus was saying uh, was very, something very much like it was argued in uh, Greece. Uh, if you read the Republic under uh, what Socrates said, uh, I had to read the Republic as an undergraduate at the University of Chicago, and somehow they never made it clear just what it was all about. And at the very beginning, Socrates said, uh, what if you borrow a weapon from somebody and the person's a maniac? And he's going to use that weapon to hurt society. Do you have to return the weapon to him? And uh, finally, you know, the person said, well, no, I guess that's not a very good idea. And the, after a long, the whole discussion of the rest of the Republic is Socrates says, well, what happens if you owe money to the rich people and they're destroying society? Do you have to repay them? Somehow this economic uh, aspect of uh, uh, the Republic in Plato and Socrates gets as little attention as the economic uh, history of the Bible. Uh, well, basically, uh, Socrates explains, there's a problem with people who have money. There's a problem with rich people, and that is they become greedy for money. They have wealth addiction, and the Greek vocabulary has all sorts of words for wealth addiction, for money love, and uh, uh, if you read the plays of Aristophanes, uh, if you read uh, uh, the poetry of Solon, it's all about if uh, rich people get rich, they not only want to get more money, they want to hurt the poor. They want to lord it over the rest of society, and they want to get rich in what economists would call a zero-sum activity. Their gain is at somebody else's loss. And so uh, what was perceived uh, for the next few centuries was that uh, the good thing about canceling the debts is you cancel the savings on the other side of the balance sheet. You cancel all this, these financial claims of the rich people that are going to use their money to do what the prophets, uh, biblical prophets said, buy up more land, drive off the smallholders, uh, take control. Uh, and Rome was the first society not to do that. In fact, you could say that the distinguishing feature of Western civilization, as distinct from the takeoff of civilization in the ancient Near East, is that Western, uh, Greece and Rome are the first uh, uh, countries not to cancel the debts, where the oligarchy took over, where in Rome they killed the king, they drove them out. And anyone who at, wanted to cancel the debt was accused of aspiring to kingship uh, and should be killed. In Greece, they said, aspiring to tyranny. Uh, uh, the, the whole idea was uh, to, to prevent this and without uh, any kind of restoring uh, the economic uh, sustainability of uh, families, uh, the result of that was leading uh, to the Dark Ages. Now, they had long discussions of this in Babylonia. Uh, they knew that if you didn't cancel the debts, uh, the debtors would flee the land. They'd go to somewhere else. Uh, already uh, in, uh, I think, the uh, third century in the BC, a Greek military tactician said, if you want to conquer a city, uh, promise to cancel the debts, and the people will come over to your side. Or if you want to defend a city, promise to cancel the debts, the people will join the army and they'll fight for their land and they'll fight for the city. And uh, uh, basically, that it was very clear that this was what uh, politics was all about then. Western civilization changed all of this. Uh, you can understand how uh, modern uh, histories of uh, the Bible or Greece and Rome uh, omit this basic fact. Uh, there's a, 
even last year there was another book on the origins of money who believed that when uh, Hammurabi's contemporary uh, uh, canceled the debts uh, in the neighboring town canceled, uh, conquered by Hammurabi, uh, it must have been a financial crash. You couldn't imagine the idea of that uh, canceling the debts would maintain stability, maintain price stability, maintain uh, general uh, equality in the sense of uh, equality of being able to be self-sustaining. They couldn't imagine that a society would work that way. So the benefit, the reason that I wrote uh, my book, uh, Forgive Them Their Debts, is because you can see that for uh, century after century, for thousands of years, the way that stability and self-sufficiency and military uh, defense and political stability was maintained was by canceling the debts, not enforcing them, the exact opposite of uh, uh, what you're told today. And if you can imagine someone from the Chicago School, someone from uh, Donald Trump's administration, or Hillary Clinton going in a time machine, going back to the Bronze Age of 3000 BC and saying, let us help you organize a society, that society would be polarizing very quickly, everybody would run away, and it would be very quickly conquered. So uh, that's the choice, uh, whether you're going to have a, uh, a stable society today or whether you're going to write down the debts uh, and best of all, write off the savings that are the counterparts of the debts by the 1% that hold uh, almost all of the stocks and bonds in the United States and other countries today. Thank you, um, Dr. Hudson. I wanted to now turn us over to Reverend Dr. Liz Theo Harris, who has been, um, you know, working with uh, the poor and dispossessed in the United States and around the world for more than two decades, and um, whose book, Always With Us, What Jesus Really Said About the Poor, offers a profound understanding of the, eco of the economic program of the Bible and Jesus' teachings and the movement that, that he was uh, building at the time. So I wanted to ask you as part of your remarks, kind of what opportunities does this analysis of debt and the economy um, of antiquity that Dr. Hudson has offered, what opportunities does that bring us in terms of the movement um, and role of the poor uh, in history and as well as today? Great, thank you so much. It's uh, great to be here with folks um, and great to have folks following online. Um, getting some messages from people all over the country. So thank you for those. Keep sending. So today is a number of days. It's April 15th, which means in the United States it's tax day. It's the Monday after Palm Sunday in the Christian tradition, which uh, in our Poor People's Campaign we call the first moral Monday, right? It's the Monday when Jesus enters the temple um, and stops the money changing. Um, and it's also in, in this week where uh, Passover will be um, remembered and observed and uh, um, seders where folks will, will think about time when people needed to, to be freed from slavery and debt and bondage um, and how we have to take up similar fights today. And so it feels really appropriate to be uh, having this conversation and, and hearing about the important work of Dr. Hudson um, this evening. So indeed, I think that there is a lot um, from this book and from the work on which it stands, um, decades of work, in fact. Um, uh, it makes a major contribution, I think, to, to the fields of economics and to the fields of theology. Um, two topics um, and two fields that I think uh, are at the base of everything that matters um, in general and definitely matters to a movement of the poor and dispossessed in the United States and around the world. Um, and and it, it shows that we need to meld these two topics, that we can't really understand um, the Bible and theology without actually studying the the economic empires on which it was reacting to. Um, and it also, I think, says that we, we aren't going to get theology right um, unless we actually understand this economic base as well. Um, and so, um, you know, there, there is a lot, I think, to, to learn from this book. And, and 
you know, I think it's it, it goes beyond a conversation about debt and debt forgiveness in the ancient world. Um, and, and in fact, I think sends us towards why it is that um, we are who we are and ho are how we are as a society um, in, a, in a country that has 140 million people who are poor and low income, in a, in a society where 80% um, of people at some point won't be able to meet needs, um, in a society where more than half of the population can't afford a $400 emergency in a society where um, we basically owe more than we uh, in debt than we own. Um, I, you know, I think it's really relevant um, today. So I come to this topic, you know, first as a as a pastor. Um, uh, I'm a Christian pastor uh, who follows uh, a savior named Jesus, who you know traveled around. The, the land setting up free healthcare clinics, um, who teaches parables that say that the last will be first and the first shall be last, that um, proclaims that how a nation treats uh, the poor is how that nation treats God, and who is executed by the Roman Empire for uh, building a movement to forgive debt um, and to bring down Caesar. Um, who is the biggest creditor of them all, as, as we learned from, from Dr. Hudson. I'm also a biblical scholar and, and interested in, in what the Bible really has to say about poverty, what the Bible really has to say about wealth, what the Bible really has to say about debt. Um, and, uh, you know, one of the, th the things I like to teach the most, and, and it, it really comes into way more clear relief with the, with the work that Dr. Hudson's doing, um, is the book of De Deuteronomy, um, all of the codes around economics and laws and regulations around how society is supposed to organize itself, um, uh, you know, especially around the Jubilee, especially around the Shemitah, um, especially around these, these different pieces of, of forgiving debts and organizing society around the least of, of these who are most of the people living in that society. And, and then as, as a leader in this Poor People's Campaign, um, uh, we have uh, pulled together out of the struggles of poor people across this country a set of demands and are, are launching a budget in the next couple of months that, that will show basically how all of society prospers when indeed you forgive debts, when you raise wages, when you organize society around the needs of everyone. And, um, you know, to be able to draw on, on some of the scholarship that, that Dr. Hudson has in the book is really helpful. I want to say two things if people haven't read the book. Um, there's a, a two pieces of kind of Americana in there um, that he's able to kind of turn on its head. Um, one is, is um, the Statue of Liberty, right? Um, this, this symbol of, of freedom uh, and liberty. In, in this country and how um, that statue of raising uh, a, a lamp is, is about this kind of forgiving of debts. Is, it's about this um, organizing of society around the, the needs of the poor. And, that, and to have that in our symbols, um, you know, as we add to and, and have deepened an understanding of, of what that, that means, as well as, as the, the Liberty Bell. Um, you know, in, in this work, um, you know, what, what's, what's inscribed actually on that Liberty Bell um, that sits in Philadelphia is, is a quote from a Leviticus, right? And it's talking about proclaiming liberty throughout the land. And, and what Dr. Hudson shows, and, and, and abolitionists actually said and she, I knew um, back then, which was that liberty isn't about the freedom to oppress, but that liberty is actually indeed the, the forgiveness of debts. Um, and that the, the word for liberty, um, as Dr. Hudson was talking about earlier, is, is about um, debt release and debt forgiveness. Um, and so to, to imagine what it is to be a country with a Statue of Liberty and with that Liberty Bell and having, um, you know, this totally turning of its head on the, on the system 
um, and how important that is. So I, I wanted to look at, at five little um, texts um, in, in the Bible that are really impacted by this, this reading. Um, uh, in, in the book of the Gospel of, of Matthew, um, uh, Jesus is called the Lord of the Sabbath. Um, and so, so with this understanding of Sabbath and Jubilee, release and debt forgiveness, um, what it is to have a Lord, uh, a, a ruler, someone who, who, who kind of determines what you do in the world um, and in life, as a, a Lord of debt release, um, and especially when you, when you go back um, to code, codes like the Hammurabi Code, um, to see like, how incredibly significant and revolutionary um, then a Lord of the Sabbath is, right? Um, that you know, the book of, of, of Matthew has more mentions of slavery, more mentions of wealth than any other um, book in the New Testament. And, um, and then to have that countered with this, this idea that, that, um, that there's this Lord of, of, of debt forgiveness um, uh, and just imagining as opposed to the lords who, who you're indebted to, as opposed to the lords who you're enslaved to, as opposed to the lords um, that you, you know, are sent to prison because of, um, to have uh, that kind of debt release um, as, as central to who um, Jesus is, is so important. Then there's the, the title of, of Dr. Hudson's book in terms of, forgive us, our debts. Um, and in fact, the, the only prayer that we're taught um, by Jesus himself in the Bible is a prayer that is all about forgiving debts. It's all about on earth as it is in heaven. Um, and so to take economics out of that, which is what all of our religious institutions and churches have done, is, is to, to completely write out the real meaning, the real um, central uh, topic of, of it. And, and, and as Dr. Hudson was talking about, this inaugural sermon of Jesus's where he says he's here to bring good news, um, uh, and that good news is, you know, the root of what evangelism, what evangelicals are. Um, and so to imagine in our society today um, that you can't be an evangelical without proclaiming debt release um, and, and living wages. Um, that that's, that's what it is, um, nothing more, and maybe nothing, surely less. Um, obviously, this topic of, of taxes and its relationship to debt, I think, is another really important piece um, to, to read um, this idea that Jesus teaches of, of resisting paying taxes to the empire um, because of, of the emperor's face being on that coin. There's, there's a lot to be learned from, from the work that Dr. Hudson is doing on, um, on tax resistance um, as it relates to debt forgiveness, as it then relates to the practices of poor people um, back then and today, um, mutually supporting each other and, um, and, and building a movement. Um, and, then, and then, you know, my favorite passage is one from, um, from Matthew as well, but it's also in John and Mark, and it's about um, uh, the poor will be with you always. Um, it's the most famous line in the Bible about poverty, um, and it's actually a quoting of the Jubilee um, tenants. Um, and it's basically reminding people that if you don't organize society around forgiving debts, releasing slaves, paying people a living wage, and lending out money knowing that you will never get paid back, then you will always have poverty. You'll always have poor people. But if you follow the commandments that God has given and that, that our response to these, um, these um, codes um, from history, then, you know, everybody will prosper. Um, and, and so, you know, I think that that is, is such an important message uh, today, and, and I really thank um, and credit Dr. Hudson for, for pointing those kinds of pieces out. Thank you, uh, Reverend Dr. Theo Harris. Um, 
Dr. Nyang, could we continue um, in thinking about you know, economics and the New Testament and how we start to bring some of this back into our scholarship and understanding of, of the Bible and, and Jesus' teachings? Thank you very much. Um, before I start uh, responding to the question, I would like to say English is my ninth language, so you bear with me. <laughs> Um, so, um, again, I come from West Africa, and uh, I am from the Jola group of people who live in the southern part of Senegal. So, in that context, uh, when the French came, and that's how I'm going to start from that context, because when I read the New Testament, I can't help to look at some archives, but also uh, historians who put together uh, records about the French colonial practices in West Africa. So, but I will focus on my people, the Jolo people, uh, and the reason for that is to avoid speculation. All right, the Jolo people have been known as savages, primitive, a group of people who resist centralized government. I wonder why. There's a reason for that. That resistance is anchored on a sense of having people work together to promote mutuality. Since they were agrarian people, that's how they lived. Making sure egalitarian uh, notions of how people can make life better for one another. So the Jolo people really valued that. When the French came, they decided that uh, maybe introducing new laws might help. And in doing that, the Jola agricultural practices, which is based upon raising, uh, uh, cultivating rice, is changed to a cash crop. And your book definitely provide tremendous insights into that. The crash crop then created a problem in Jola society, where mutuality now, it's no longer the case. Uh, now we have competition, right? So as a New Testament student, I kept on thinking about why the Jola people wanted to maintain their customs that encourage the kind of agriculture where most people have something. And then as I was studying the Bible, I became um, aware of some voices in the biblical text, as already mentioned, that tend to speak about caring for those who have not. I wondered why. And I often tell my students, every time you see or hear voices that tend to emphasize those who are left behind, there may be some greedy people in that kind of community who are actually giving rise to those concerns. And I think we heard that in the two presentations um, uh, a while ago. Now, so the French then resorted to some techniques that were quite uh, disappointing, using the Jola people themselves as middlemen to ensure those, uh, their, the cash crop is basically forced into the Jola land. No. But I also I would say this, some Jola decided maybe it's good to join the new cash crop 
and so you can make money and compete. Uh, some Jola did that. But many wanted to maintain the traditional life. Now, having said that, let me then move on to my New Testament. In the New Testament, once I read the parables, I saw some very interesting parables, especially in the Gospel of Mark, where you have this great concern about wealth. And this is Matthew 25, or Luke 19, where you have this absentee, so to speak, landlord or landowner who called servants, the Matthew particularly, they were three, to one, five talents, to another, two, and to the third, one. I found that parable fascinating. Having been socialized and also taught in Baptist schools and then went to many churches, I heard the parable preached in a very interesting way where the heroes of the parable were the one who multiplied, which is quite uh, interesting. The one five multiplied, and then the one with two talents multiplied also. And uh, what's interesting is the parable is read, and many readers of the parable stop at those two. Quite interesting. And it's easy to do that. Why? Because they seem to be productive, right? If we follow the kind of competitive economy we have. Uh, that sounds good, right? But I'm more fascinated by the third and the books by William Herzog on um, parables as subversive speech. I love that book. Yes, because that book uh, pointed out something that many have missed. Encouraging the kind of usury, if I'm mistaken, your book uh, mentioned something about that. And uh, I have not read it all because uh, I got some pieces of it from a friend of mine to help me prepare for this. It's still transiting through the mail. So, um, so I usually, the, the two people that most readers of the parable love, nobody ever thought maybe they actually engage in usurious practice, which is quite interesting. So I decided I love the third one. The third was very honest and said to the master, well, um, I know who you are. You take what doesn't belong to you. That's quite fascinating. I'm not sure how we miss that. Yeah, we miss, we read over that. I mean, it just opens up the entire parable and what Matthew was trying to do. And Luke does the same thing too, but uses a different structure. So listening to the language, the response of the third, and the response of the master also have gone completely, uh, well, it disappeared completely from most people who preach from that parable. All I heard a pastor who said, oh, Jesus was really a capitalist. I said, excuse me? <laughs> did, did you just miss the parable? And so the third then, um, generated a response from the master. And the master said, well, uh, you, <laughs> you knew, as if to say, well, let me paraphrase, you knew I was a crook, so to speak. Why didn't you? That's, right. That's quite interesting. I'm not sure how we missed that in churches. So that parable <laughs> uh, and the response of the master but also the conversation seems to suggest, according to Richard Robark or uh, also Herzog, that actually this person, the third, 
used to be part of that corrupt system and just got tired of it and said something that happens in our modern context time and again. Richard Robar called this person, the third, a whistleblower. I mean, it's quite interesting. I mean, destabilizing that kind of predatory practice in Jesus' time. And thank you for your book. So, as a jeweler then, that takes me back to West Africa. When the French asked the jeweler people to begin selling their rice. And for a jeweler people to sell rice is almost uh, violating the divine gift. Because for a jeweler, rice is a sacred crop. Now imagine someone coming and say, sell your sacred crop to join this new economy. Would you have done it? Well, some, unfortunately, some Jola did. Others refused. So as I read the New Testament also, I'm reminded on how to contextualize these parables, not only that I just read, but also teachings in the Luke 4, 19, or um, the book of Amos, chapter 5, or Isaiah 61, which actually reappears in Jesus' uh, language. So I become fascinated with now trying to challenge our modern context not only to reread the Bible and see what we can do, but also to see that mutuality is healthy. And the practice of mutuality is something maybe that we need to consider in our modern context. But I'm afraid of saying that as a foreigner from West Africa because I know how this city, New York, looks like. It terrifies me. Um, I'm more comfortable in a village context. But as God will have it, I'm in a seminary trying to teach. And I always f try to encourage my students to look at the New Testament and look at how the language of agrarian concerned people might be reading the text with them here in New York. And let me just continue some things that I wanted to say. When students can hardly pay off their loans, workers struggling to support their families with more than one job, middle class uh, succumbing to manufactured poverty. The 1% elite enjoy unprecedented wealth at the expense of 99% of the world population. That's something is wrong with that picture. On the heels of this demoralizing spiritual and eth ethical conundrum, Dr. Hudson, like a century prophet, utters the resounding invitation and forgive them their debt. <laughs> that's quite, that invitation is sobering just to look at the book title. It should actually raise questions as we look at it. The work marshals evidence from our ancestors. I love the word ancestors. Ancestors who confronted with elitist greed offered a more excellent way to borrow the Apostle Paul's language, a subsistence to borrow the Pauline language, a subsistence economy, and that is helpful. Let me just use subsistence level economy based upon the exercise, I think, of mutuality. If I'm not mistaken, 
or misread the pages my friend Hop sent me, especially the last pages. Dr. Hurston shows us how the Mosaic law promoted such a noble and egalitarian subsistence level economy just to be hijacked by kings, monarchs, and aristocrats. Influenced by ancient Near Eastern tradition, the Mosaic egalitarian vision we read in Leviticus, Deuteronomy, was taken up by eighth century prophets, Isaiah. And then I was interested when I read Jeremiah. In Jeremiah, you have Zedekiah uh, proclaiming liberty, freedom. And I wondered whether this is politically motivated or was it just the realization that they were creating a dependent society. So um, the prophet Amos talked about that. And to testamental sages were concerned about those who are left behind. Jesus spoke of it. Um, Paul found a very interesting way to do it. And scholars refer to it as relief offering. <laughs> Maybe to tackle the issue in a different way. Uh, some call it the collection for the poor. I found that to be a very interesting way to subvert the Greco-Roman patron-client way of doing things. So um, I want to close then with a quotation that I was really, uh, it, it struck me when I received the pages. A quotation uh, documented by Doug Ackman. He presented this at SBL, Society of Biblical Literature. And quoting from the book of Peter Brown, here is what um, Doug Ackman wants us to think about. Farmers could bring their produce into the nearest town, but the rich had privileged access to wider and more lucrative markets. They alone could defeat distance. That's quite crucial. The rich alone could also defeat time. They could store the abundance of the harvest and wait to sell when the prices were at their highest. Not surprisingly, therefore, granaries emerge as the economic villains of the ancient world. That's striking. This, I move to Dr. Hudson's quote. <laughs> um, it's interesting. A market economy usually is seen to be grounded in making credit and land ownership secure. That is not reversible by royal fiat. Turning financial wealth and credit into land ownership and control of labor is seen as progress toward efficiency. In this view, Bronze Age, and I just heard him say that, Bronze Age law to prevent the emergence of a creditor class from differentiating the citizenry appear to have been a false start, not as regulating economic regulations and markets to prevent economic growth and military stability, despite the fact that our civilization calls itself, and this is striking too, Judeo-Christian, it abhors the admonition to cancel debts. That's mind-blowing, placed at the core of the Mosaic law and the sermons of Jesus. The idea of restoring economic balance by canceling debt is radically at odds with how modern ideology thinks society should be organized. Most economists and historians imagine that 
periodic debt amnesty must always have been inherently unworkable in practice. If not outright utopian, the practice is assumed to have been economically destructive and tyrannical. And then I'll end with this one. I just couldn't help it. Um, yes, I mean, it's striking. And this is why the conversation between theology, theologians, New Testament scholars, and economists should be actually the new phase. Okay, here it is. Economic ideology plays the role today that religion moral, religious morality did in time past. Mainstream economists depict money and debt as only a veil, not affecting the distribution of income and wealth except to finance growth. Even in the wake of the, the tribution of economy and wealth except, no, wait a minute, at the wake of the 2008 debt crisis and subsequent Greek national bankruptcy. This ideology is silent as the socially coercive effect of debt praying away control of the land, natural resources, and the organs of government. The thousand Year of years of political and religious conflict over the debt issue trace in preced preceding chapters provide a repertory of how the early millennia of our civilization debt will be will uh, with this problem. In their policy, in many cases, was more successful than today. It is because they recognize that insisting that all debt must be paid meant for closures, economic polarization, and impoverishment of the economy at large. Uh, thank you, Dr. Hudson. Um, what we need to do is assign your book in not only theology classes, but also deep exegetical courses in New Testament mm -hmm. to ensure what you're saying is understood and also transmitted to the next generation. Thank you. Dr. Hudson, would you like to take a few minutes to um, you know, respond to this discussion? Okay. Um, regarding uh, Dr. Nyang's quite uh, nice comments uh, about the exegesis in the Bible, reading the Bible will not explain how ancient society actually worked. Uh, history is necessary. Anthropology. Uh, just reading the Bible is, uh, it can provide parables, it can provide background, but it won't tell you really how the living society that produced it operated and uh, what the role was uh, in the early discussions as compared to what it is today. Uh, Liz mentioned uh, the uh, Statue of Liberty uh, and how that goes back. It, the, the origins of a figure holding a sacred torch was Hammurabi. Yeah. And uh, the, uh, we have the cuneiform documents on clay uh, saying that when the ruler raises a sacred torch, that's uh, a sign that debts are canceled throughout the land. And in Babylonia, which is southern Iraq, uh, many of the cities uh, had temples, uh, which were the highest uh, uh, buildings uh, in them, and you could see the torch from city to city, and literally that would be the sign for uh, canceling the debts. Uh, you can imagine the uh, uh, irony that today the Statue of Liberty uh, is for the country going around uh, essentially uh, destroying any economy that doesn't pay its debts. There's been an inversion of civilization, uh, basically, uh, uh, just the opposite. Uh, and another uh, inversion of civilization, uh, the, in the uh, whole, if you go in to visit uh, uh, Congress, uh, the House of Representatives, uh, in, as you go in, there are a whole series of busts 
of uh, supposedly the, the, the uh, what do you say, the mascots of uh, the American Revolution and American civilization. Well, you have right in the center, you have Moses. And we know what he did, he canceled the debts. Uh, he proclaimed the Mosaic Law. Uh, then you have Hammurabi. Uh, what did Hammurabi do? He canceled the debts again and again and again. And when he was dying, his son issued a proclamation, my father Hammurabi is dying, so I'm taking over the throne, I'm canceling all the debts. Uh, you have Solon of Athens. What did Solon do? He canceled the debts in 594 BC uh, of Athens and banned uh, uh, debt bondage. Uh, you have Lycurgus, who is the mythical founder of Sparta. And according to the myth, what did Lycurgus do? He uh, canceled the debts and uh, redistributed uh, the lands held by the enslaved population, so everybody had as many slaves as everybody else. Uh, that was their form of equality, but that was a slave society uh, back then. Now, if these are the people who uh, founded uh, uh, the civilization as seen by uh, the people who built the House of Representatives, where did civilization go wrong? How did we make a, an about face uh, that's exactly the opposite of the people who uh, we talked about, uh, a Judeo-Christian uh, civilization, uh, how, why, how do we have the exact opposite message of these philosophers, uh, of Jesus, of uh, subsequent uh, theologians? Uh, there has been really an about face, and uh, uh, I think that's what makes Western civilization different from er uh, all the rest of the world's civilization. The rest of the world didn't go fall apart the way that Rome destroyed Western Europe. Uh, it continued to go forward. Uh, the Roman Empire did succeed in the part you don't read about in the uh, Hollywood movies, the Eastern Roman Empire, Byzantium, uh, where you had through the 9th and the 10th uh, centuries uh, the emperors. What did they do? They can, uh, again and again, they canceled the debts and they uh, nullified the land transfers. And the, uh, uh, you have the proclamations of the uh, Byzantine emperors. They were called novels, meaning new law. Uh, and uh, basically, uh, you had them saying, if we don't uh, cancel, re return the lands to the rich people, the dinatoi, the word comes from dynamic, uh, dynastic, the dynatoi, uh, the rich people. If we don't uh, take over, take back the lands that they had distributed, then uh, they're going to use their wealth to hire their own army, and they're going to fight us, and uh, they're going to say, make loans to labor, and now labor is going to own owe their labor to the rich people, and they're not be able to pay their taxes. They can't use their crops for taxes. They can't uh, work on the public works. Uh, and in fact, that's just exactly what the rich people in Babylonia did. They hired their own army to say, we want freedom, the freedom for any government to say that we can't oppress and take away the freedom of the population. Freedom for us is the freedom to take away other people's freedom. That is the freedom that is the free market is taught by the Chicago School, by Harvard, and by every you know, every economics department in the country. Free market means the free. Uh, uh, there is no debt forgiveness. Uh, uh, history is irreversible. Your debt is irreversible. Your poverty is irreversible because that's efficient. It's, uh, and we know it's efficient because the head of uh, Goldman Sachs has said our uh, partners are paid more than anyone else in the United States. They are the most productive. And if you look at gross na America's gross national product since 2008, all of the growth in gross national product has been to the top 5% of the population. For the 95%, it's shrunk. Well, what, what has happened is that uh, the rich people will create an army, and they'll use that army to try to get rid of any power strong enough to prevent them from canceling the debts. And that's just what they did in uh, the Byzantine Empire in the 10th century. And uh, so the emperor uh, uh, went to war with uh, the generals that were hired uh, by the rich families and, and defeated him. And then uh, they you know, had a, a meal to celebrate the peace. They were all going to get together, and uh, 
the uh, emperor uh, turned to the uh, general and said, how do we prevent this kind of war from happening again? And uh, Psellicus, one of the chroniclers uh, who wrote the chronicles of this, and said in his chronicle, the general gave uh, the emperor some advice that may be very surprising from a, a general from a rich family. He said, you've got, to get, you've got to prevent the wealthy family from getting rich. You've got to tax away their money, their, uh, whatever they have. You've got to uh, keep them so busy that they won't be able to have the money to uh, uh, grab uh, the land of the smallholders and uh, take the, their labor and uh, mount an army uh, to fight you. Well, this exact same uh, story occurred in the seventh century BC in, in Greece, when you had uh, the uh, so-called tyrant of uh, 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 Corinth uh, uh, talking to other tyrants. The tyrants, uh, uh, you may think of tyrants as being bad people. The, the Greek tyrants, there's been as much of a revolution in Greek history as there has been in biblical history. The tyrants were the good guys. They were the people that overthrew the autocracy that was enslaving people for debt. The tyrants were the people who came, canceled the debts, redistributed the, the land, put the people to work building public work, and created democracy. Now, uh, if you look in any history book, the fact that your language says that the people who created democracy are tyrants and they're bad, that shows you where our civilization has gone. And uh, uh, one of the tyrants, uh, 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 there's a question of which, who was visiting who, but the story goes, one tyrant visiting another and said, you know, what do I do, you know, to keep, uh, to prevent a revolution in the oligarchy taking control of uh, uh, our uh, city again? And uh, the other tyrant, they were walking by a field of grain and he took a scythe and he evened, he, he made even the grain. And that was a sign like, you've got to cut them down and make them all even. I think uh, in our language, they still say the tall poppy syndrome. If you look at the tall poppy syndrome, that means that when one per, the, the nail that uh, stands up gets pounded down, as we say in Irish. Uh, if you let uh, a uh, elite uh, group uh, gain power, they're going to prevent any central authority that's able to prevent them from uh, just grabbing everything they can. And that's why a number of historians of uh, Greek and uh, the tyrannies of Corinth, Megara, uh, Athens, Sparta, uh, they called them mafiosi. Uh, it was, these are really mafiosi cities, and the tyrants overthrew the mafiosi and uh, created uh, the armies uh, and the population, uh, the citizens w were simultaneous with the army. It wasn't until Rome that the, uh, the citizens were all driven off the land and you had to hire uh, uh, foreign uh, professional army people that then worked for the generals who then took over uh, uh, Rome like Crassus did. So uh, how, how do you deal with uh, the fact that Western civilization, what people think is a free market, is the reverse of what economic freedom was in antiquity. It was the freedom to uh, exploit other people, to take away their land, to reduce them to bondage, to uh, load them down with student loans and mortgage loans and credit card loans, uh, and that's uh, call, all called being uh, productive today. Well, as late as the 14th, uh, 13th century, uh, you had uh, Ibn Khaldun, uh, a North African philosopher who uh, had developed a whole theory of history saying that in order to survive, a society has to be based on mutual aid. Uh, this is what uh, the Russian prince Peter Kropotkin wrote his book on mutual aid. He said, but unfortunately, uh, this usually requires a revolution, and uh, you'll have a leader who establishes mutual aid, who uh, gets rid of the inequality. This usually lasts uh, only 125 years, uh, and the leader who is going to uh, have a a son, and then the son will have a grandson, and it all ends up like Thomas Mann's Buddenbrooks. Uh, the family goes downhill, and the, the children become arrogant, and uh, they're sort of like uh, 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 people uh, in New York City living on their trust funds. The, they really don't have much of a sense of uh, uh, society uh, or other people outside of themselves. Uh, the fact is that the problem of the poor is uh, the same thing as having the problem of a rich overclass that's exploitative, 
and that uh, tries to fight against government. And what is unique about Western civilization is they've developed a whole philosophy that is antithetical to Socrates, Jesus, uh, Hammurabi, Moses. Uh, it, 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 it is uh, Milton Friedman's uh, free market uh, of Ayn Rand, uh, Donald Trump, uh, Hillary Clinton, uh, the gang. Uh, and how are you going to uh, uh, get rid of the, uh, the gang? Uh, the fact is that uh, all ancient societies, just like uh, uh, low-income societies today, looks at wealth as being corrupting. Uh, and uh, you have mutual aid, usually among uh, low-income societies, because that's the only way they can survive. Uh, way into the 19th century. Uh, I gave a talk in Austria a little while ago and they were saying, you know, everybody had uh, you know, their cows, they were mutually supportive of their neighbors. If uh, somebody got sick, you'd help them. And if the cow got sick, that's you know, really a problem and uh, you'd help them. And uh, somehow that's how society survived. Uh, but once uh, you had wealthy people taking away everybody's cows and uh, uh, land and means of support, you don't have this uh, anymore. So the problem uh, is the tendency of rich people to have uh, wealth as addictive. This is the opposite. It's what is told in every economics 101 course, which is based on diminishing marginal utility. As the rich get richer and richer, they don't need it more, and so they sort of, we don't need it, you can have some. Uh, and the idea that it's like having wealth is like bananas. Uh, you can, the first banana is good, but after a little bit, the enjoyment of each banana goes down. Well, uh, already in Aristophanes' plays, uh, you, you see this is exactly the opposite, that wealth is not like eating a banana. Uh, it's not that you get satiated. You get insatiable. You need more and more and more. And you keep on uh, doubling, and uh, wealth is addictive, and uh, that's what uh, uh, Goldman Sachs is for. It uh, enables you to keep uh, building up that compound interest uh, uh, to get rich. Uh, so what you have is not only uh, Christianity and Judaism uh, with their message, you have uh, Stoicism in Greece and Rome saying exactly the same message. You have the same message in the uh, Native American uh, 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 tribal societies that were conquered. You have the same message in anthropologist. Uh, my friend uh, David Graeber has written a book, Death the First for 5,000 Years, where he describes how uh, uh, people treat debt uh, anthropologically. Uh, so uh, you have Western civilization not as the norm. You think that somehow we've been able to conquer everybody else and therefore we're the norm and that works. Well, Rome conquered everybody and it was the norm and it didn't work. It ended up in feudalism in Europe and civilization only survived in the East. Well, we're in exactly in the same path uh, today, uh, the same kind of disparity, and most of all, the same kind of uh, justification. Uh, you have uh, Cicero, who was the uh, great literary stylist of Rome. Uh, uh, he uh, personally uh, murdered, uh, the, uh, put to death, without trial, illegally, uh, the followers of Catiline who wanted to cancel the debts. Uh, so, and the Romans at least exiled Cicero and then uh, he came back and was promptly killed. But before he was killed, uh, this was in about 43 BC, the year before Caesar was assassinated. He had also passed a bankruptcy law and the Senate all decided to kill him. Cicero wrote to his brother, I wish I could have been there with the senators to celebrate the Ides of March. Uh, and this is the uh, respectable literary class of Rome. The, uh, every society has a University of Chicago school of uh, right-wing <laughs> economics, uh, whether it's uh, Rome or Judea or uh, Greece or Babylonia. And, uh, but you have to realize that uh, uh, although Margaret Thatcher said there is no alternative, there is an alternative. Uh, and uh, you, if you're aware of the alternative, then when you're dealing with the sky pilots who talk about the Bible as if, uh, you know, the dinosaurs and the human beings and you have to pay your debts and Jesus can make you rich, uh, <laughs> you can know uh, that, what they're, that they hate everything about the Bible and uh, that they're not the original, originalists at all. So we do have some time now for questions from the audience. I wonder if we should just take a few, and then we can um, and then we can respond to them all together. So, oh, okay. uh, I don't know if it's on. 
I'm loud enough. I can say it. No, okay, check, check. Yeah. yeah, so the question is um, simply, what, is, what would something like Jubilee look like in today's economic context? And the reason I ask the question is because obviously you have two big parts of it. One is debt cancellation, but the other is giving back land, which back then would be the means of production or capital. But living in like a currency economy, we don't necessarily have that same thing. So what would it mean today to give people back the means of production? What would that look like? Well, we have a very good example of a debt cancellation in a modern society. It's called the German economic miracle. Uh, in 1948, the Allied monetary reforms canceled all internal uh, German debts, except for the debts that employers owed their employees, and except for the minimum balances that everybody uh, needed. Uh, and it was easy to cancel, and that was the free market. That's what created the German free market. That's what created the economic miracle. Now, it was easy to cancel the debts then, because most debts were owed to the Nazis. Uh, they, who else in World War II would have ended up rich? Uh, you ended up rich by being a Nazi, so it was either easy. How do we treat Goldman Sachs like the Nazis? That's the question. How do we say, look, they don't deserve it any more than the uh, ruling class of Germany did in 1948? Uh, uh, so uh, uh, it can simply be done. Uh, the land issue today, uh, we're not uh, an agricultural economy anymore. Only 3% of the economy is agriculture. Uh, I live in Forest Hills and they won't let people, homeowners there, grow vegetables in their gardens. They say that's lower class uh, and it'll hurt the property values. So you have to have an absolutely sterile uh, uh, lawn. The key is that the lawn has to deplete the soil. Uh, you can't have any kind of a plant that somehow uh, preserves soil <laughs> fertility uh, there. So uh, all you can do uh, is provide uh, homes. Uh, and I've been think I, I've had discussions recently, uh, as, as you know, the whole issue about reparations uh, for what do you do that America has become a racist society, uh, excluding uh, black people. Well. To talk about reparations for slavery is very difficult because uh, uh, so many generations have passed and so, so much has changed. Uh, but there's something much more immediate than slavery. When the blacks were really disenfranchised, that was in 1945. Uh, from 1945 to today, when uh, blacks could not get mortgages to have a home. What almost, the wealth of almost all of the middle class in the United States is home ownership. They have their own home. You could go to any bank when you're growing up and everybody could afford, if you had a job, uh, you'd go to the bank and they would give you a mortgage to buy a home based on 25% of your wage income that uh, it, uh, would be, to pay the mortgage that would self-amortize in 30 years. So at the end of your working life, people didn't live that long back then, uh, they'd have their own home. The white people had this, the blacks didn't. Uh, I'd like to say an anecdote, but I'd better not. Uh, <laughs> I lived on the Lower East Side on 2nd Street and Avenue B. Uh, and it, it was uh, the studio where the BBC, we made, it was soundproofed, it was a brownstone. I bought it for one dollar down, with, uh, the, the rest was a, a mortgage, because a dollar was all I had at the time, this is 1967. And uh, uh, we made BBC uh, newsreels there, we did, it was uh, where I lived for 20 years. But I wanted to move at a certain point, uh, and, uh, and uh, I tried to take out a mortgage. Uh, the, so I called the bank where I'd worked in the uh, 1960s, Chase Manhattan. Uh, they sent out a, uh, uh, an appraiser. Uh, he kept, every five minutes he'd run out to see whether the, uh, somebody had stolen his uh, automobile tires. And then he said, I can't, this, this, uh, he said, only a blank would live here. I, I think on, we're being filmed so I can't say it. Uh, and so uh, I, he said, you know, we can't, uh, we don't lend to them. Uh, I made a complaint to the Civil Liberties Union about this, uh, uh, racist union, nothing, nothing came of it, uh, hardly by surprise. Uh, but uh, the, if you weren't white, you could not uh, get uh, on to the uh, home ownership line that any white person was able to do. So I think uh, the, the way of uh, creating the equality that was talked about of uh, the self-supporting homestead in the past is a, everybody should have a home free and clear. 
That means you don't cancel the mortgage debts because otherwise you'd make Donald Trump, who only it's all his money's borrowed. Uh, you don't want the landlords to get uh, rich, but you uh, you have to uh, give uh, everybody a home, and uh, that's the only way to to break uh, the racist dichotomy that you have in the United States. Uh, in addition to answering your question of what would the equivalent be today? Thank you. Um, I have a question. What's the difference between uh, the U.S. debt and um, the debt that African nations own? Because the U.S. debt doesn't keep the U.S. from being one of the leading powers of the world, but then African nations can't make it because of that debt that is strangling them. Um, two, two quick questions. Um, uh, if, if debt cancellation tends to happen when a king uh, allies itself with the people against the rest of the aristocracy, and if Caesar did that as a populare, then why didn't Augustus, when he became the emperor, and why didn't that characterize the empire? And then B, you said that the Western Empire fell because of a lack of debt cancellation, but why? I mean, both so sides of the empire were both Christian, were both governed by comparable uh, aristocracy, so why did one side fall and the other one not? Just to ask sort of a TED Talk type question, from economic and moral point of view, how do you reach out to economists and uh, fellow Christians um, with the idea that 64 people have half the world's food, you know, literally, compared to half the world. I mean, literally, if you think about it in more Bronze Age terms, 64 people have as much food as half the people on the planet. Okay. Should I talk? Okay. Uh, regard, the first question is uh, a very important question. What makes African and third world debt different from the American debt? Number one, America is never going to pay its debts. Uh, it doesn't have to. It can, its debts are in its own currency. We can simply print it. Uh, the African debt is not in its currency. The African debt is in U.S. dollars. Africa has to uh, earn the U.S. dollars, uh, and uh, the only way it can uh, earn the U.S. dollars is not to be assassinated for growing its own food and becoming uh, independent uh, and uh, doing something that the United States uh, does not like. The principle underlying the w foundation of the World Bank, uh, the International Bank for Inter uh, uh, Re uh, IBRD, uh, research, uh, the, the World Bank, is that no country should grow its own food. Africa and the third world should only grow export crops. To export, uh, uh, in order to have an oversupply of cocoa and uh, uh, other tropical raw materials, to keep down the price, they must buy their grain from the United States or Europe so that if they do something that we don't like, we can do what America tried to do to China in the 60s. We can sanction them. We can say, we're going to starve you. We're going to not export uh, any grain to you. Uh, it, 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 so owing uh, m uh, their foreign uh, debt in dollars means that they have to somehow sell something that the United States wants, not what they want. Uh, I think the, the most evil organizations in the world today are the, uh, the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund. And uh, my book, Super Imperialism, that I wrote in 1972, uh, is all about that. Uh, the largest purchasers of the book uh, were the Defense Department and the CIA. I was immediately, uh, the organization I worked for was given a $75,000, $85,000 Defense Department contract for me to come to explain to them how American imperialism worked, and they used it as an, uh, a how-to-do-it book. They thought it was just, uh, uh, they, it was just spontaneous, uh, and I had written the book thinking that socialists and third world countries uh, would do something about it, and indeed it was translated into Spanish 
English and you know, other languages. But it was really uh, the Defense Department that uh, uh, applied uh, most of this. And I was amazed when I was invited to the White House uh, uh, to explain how imperialism worked. Uh, and my boss said, we've run rings around the British imperialists. This is how to do it. Uh, you make them owe the debts in your currency, not their own. You, uh, you control their central bank uh, and make them uh, financially dependent on you, and uh, then you've, you've got a stranglehold for them. So uh, certainly the third world countries should uh, cancel the debts uh, under the odious debt principle. Uh, I haven't been able to convince any of them to do it because they said if we do that, the CIA will kill us. So how do you break that cycle? Uh, that's, a, that's a problem I've not been able to solve. Uh, the uh, next question was uh, about Augustus, I think. Uh, well, Augustus did that one of the first things he did was declare a bankruptcy law. Uh, he couldn't go further because he, uh, he was the uh, uh, adopted nephew of Julius Caesar and he knew what happened to his uncle. Uh, so uh, he had to sort of, uh, uh, his options were limited. Uh, and Let's see, the, the final one, oh, uh, 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 some joker asked why I don't talk to economists. What's the point of talking to economists? Uh, there's no way, their minds are going to go clankety-clank. Uh, I don't think uh, it's, reform, it's any more reformable talking to economists than it is to talk to uh, the Democratic Party leadership. Uh, there's nothing that uh, is going to come out of it uh, that, that they're going to do. The other thing, uh, when you were responding to the first question, um, there's also something we're suffering from in Africa, the devaluation of currency as another way of... Devaluation of... The currency. Currency, oh, currency. Yes. yes. As a way of keeping us dependent continuously. Uh, that's a good point. When a country devalues a currency, what are they devaluing? Well, you know, there's a world price for grain, a world price for aluminum, a world price for raw materials. Uh, the only thing that they can really devalue is the price of their labor. So when uh, Africa or Latin America or Greece is told to, or America is told to devalue the currency, what that means is pay labor less. Uh, you have to squeeze out more to pay the top of the economic pyramid, to suck it all up uh, to the top 10% or 1% or 0.1%. Uh, so devaluation is basically an anti-labor uh, policy to prevent a domestic market and prosperity from developing. Uh, that is why uh, the uh, China and Russia are saying, we don't want to be part of the dollar area. Uh, we want our own currency, that, and we will only borrow in our own debt. Last time I went to China, uh, it was a little annoying because they insisted in paid me, paying me in yuan, which uh, the, all, all these little red bills uh, that I, you have to go to a bank to turn in, uh, and yet they said, well, we're following your advice. Uh, how, what do you complain about? So. <laughs> What could I do? Uh, uh, it's a good idea, but at least they don't want any part of uh, uh, American sanctions. And uh, Donald Trump, uh, uh, he certainly should get the police, peace prize for really unifying the whole world. He's unified Asia, he's unified uh, Russia, he's dr driving the whole world together. I couldn't have done that, uh, but the sanctions that he's done and his policies and, uh, uh, and his threats are somehow unifying the whole world. So I think at a certain point uh, uh, you can very well have uh, certainly a wipeout of uh, uh, the, the U.S. debt. But I have to say one thing. Many of you may know of uh, uh, Bono and the Jubilee, uh, so-called uh, Jubilee movement. Uh, I'm uh, appalled at that movement. The, the essence of uh, what Bono wants to do is wipe out third world debt to governments. Well, who's in back of this? The banks are backing him. Yeah. The banks love it. The banks say, wait a minute, uh, the, uh, every country, when they pay their foreign debts, there's a ranking. Who gets paid first? The governments. Who gets paid second? The private sectors. If Bono's plan works, then the third world countries uh, don't have to pay the governments. All of their money can go to Chase Manhattan and Citibank and uh, the other, uh, the bondholders. Uh, and uh, all of this is just a cover story for the bondholders getting the money instead of uh, the government. So uh, 
unfortunately, the balance of payments is not a topic that uh, is taught in uh, any university as far as I know. Uh, I taught it in 1969, but uh, I'm no longer teaching. And uh, the, uh, the GDP, the, uh, what you uh, understand as gross domestic product and national income, that analysis is not ta taught. And if you look at the GDP, and uh, we, uh, uh, for, uh, some of uh, my associates work at the Levy Institute at Bard College, uh, you see that all of the growth in GDP is just growth in, uh, in bank uh, services. And I, uh, when I was in Washington last time, uh, heading a, a, a statistical study, I called uh, the uh, uh, stat statistician and said, what is, when uh, a credit card company raises your interest rate from 11% to 29%, uh, what, uh, where does that appear? They said, oh, that's providing a service. They're taking a risk. And I said, where's the risk? All home, all home loans today are guaranteed by the Federal Housing Authority. All student debt is guaranteed by the Housing Authority. And they said, well, risk is our word for commercial product. Uh, their product is uh, essentially uh, uh, what used to be called usury, which is a word that has disappeared from the language. Uh, uh, and uh, American law has sort of uh, uh, made it uh, a thing of the past now that uh, you can, uh, any uh, credit card company can operate in any state law. There's no longer a federal uh, regulation against usury as there was in every country of the world uh, in times past, England, France, all over the world. So uh, you, you're having uh, a stripping away of every kind of regulation, every kind of control over money. There's no concept that what should come first in the economy. There's no concept that general prosperity should come first. Instead, what comes first is the 1% not even the 10%, the 1%. And the whole economy uh, is, uh, is uh, said to revolve around the product of this 1%, and the product of this 1% is what economists call economic rent, unearned income. It's what landlords make in their sleep. It's what coupon clippers, bondholders, make in their sleep. It's what the 1% uh, earns without being productive at all uh, by essential, uh, essentially by the most productive activity of all, which is crime. And crime has become part of the free market now. It, uh, uh, President Obama decriminalized financial crime in the United States. Uh, when uh, he, he'd promised that he was going to write down the junk mortgage debts, the fraudulent debts, the massive fraud of uh, misrepresenting the debts, especially of low-income uh, and minority bor borrowers. And then, uh, as soon as he was elected, he called the bankers to the White House, and he said, boys, I know you're my campaign contributors, and uh, let me promise you, I'm the only guy standing between you and the mob with pitchforks what uh, Hillary called the deplorables, Obama called the mob with pitchforks. Uh, and uh, he m made it clear that uh, uh, his politics and those of the Democratic leadership are run for the donor class, not for the voters. And uh, the voters can vote over the rhetoric, but the policy is uh, going to be uh, that of the donor class. And uh, so instead of writing down the debts, uh, he uh, uh, directed the Federal Reserve and the Treasury to make sure that no bank went under. And uh, Sheila Baer at the Federal Deposit Insurance uh, Corporation that in insures you know, your deposits at the bank wanted to take over the crookedest bank of all, Citibank. Uh, and uh, she said they're, they're incompetent, but mostly they're, they're gangsters, they're crooks. And uh, Tim Geithner and... Uh, uh, Obama said, no, uh, you know, we're going to uh, give them, we're going to lend them as much money uh, as they want. And the result is that the, uh, uh, the Obama administration created $4.3 trillion of money to give to Wall Street, to the banks, to compensate them for the bad loans. They could have simply written down the loans. But instead, they left the debt on the books, and that is why the economy is not recovering. Our economy is gradually shrinking and shrinking and shrinking. Whenever you see GDP, you have to ask, whose GDP? Is it the GDP of the 1% or is it the, G the 5% or the rest of the economy? And the reality is you walk down the streets and you see uh, shops closing on every major street, Broadway, uh, Fifth Avenue. Uh, you'll see all, all over the closed shops, uh, the, the economy is going under. 
uh, and yet the GDP is going up. Obviously, there's a disconnect there. And the disconnect is that uh, the GDP figures are written by corporate lobbyists who've put their uh, uh, proposals in the hands of politicians. Uh, they didn't used to count uh, uh, financial gains as part of the uh, part of the product. They looked at it as a subtrahend. You have the product, and then you have what you have to what you take home. Uh, that was the GDP. What you end up with. But now it's all what you don't end up with. Forget what you do end up with. That doesn't count. It's only what you don't end up with that they consider the whole purpose of the economy being run for the financial, insurance, and the real estate uh, sector that basically is the top 1% or 5% or 10% of the economy. Uh, and it's not the economy that you're part of. So let's take one more round of questions, and then we'll I uh, have a little happier note on the German currency reevaluation. I'm old enough to have actually spoken in German to people who lived through it. Uh, the man who created Ludwig Erhard was the economist in the plot against Hitler. He survived. He had, not only did he know that the Reichsmark had to be uh, devalued basically in terms of time investments, 100 to 1, anything close such as a weekly rent or a weekly salary was 1 to 1. But the farther out in time, the less you got. In other words, the Nazi um, leadership class was wiped out. If you owned property, it was respected. But the great idea Earhart had, and this is rarely mentioned in any history book, was part of the currency reform was every man, woman, and child was given a hundred new day mark. And you had to spend it. You couldn't save it. You had to spend it to get the economy going. And people were joyous. They were absolutely joyous. And the mark, the Deutsche Mark then, was backed in silver. The coins were silver, unlike the Nazi coins. And the, the major currency was backed in gold in the Bundesbank. And the older people I spoke to, you know, it was a horrible tribulation. You know, the country was totally devastated. but. The currency reform and the 100-day mark per person, which was a lot of money then, uh, it made a big difference and it got the wheels going again. Hi, uh, Dr. Hudson. Uh, thank you for your talk. Um, as we know, we live in a finite world and nothing grows forever as per um, Kate Rayworth's book. Don't Dead's it, grow forever. That's grow. Sure. Dead, yeah, but nothing. We we need, need to try to cancel that out. As um, Don't e Economic Book by Kate Rayworth says, we need to move to that. And I'm wondering how do we argue that to people that want the growth for to keep on going on and on. That's really a different uh, question than I'm talking about. Uh, I don't think anything is going to happen uh, because uh, the American, uh, all American policy is based on the use of oil and uh, pollution for a number of reasons. Oil is the most profitable industry. It's the key, uh, it's tax, been tax exempt uh, from the beginning. It's also uh, the, uh, it's why America went to war in the Near East, as uh, uh, Vice President Cheney said, because uh, if you look at GDP in every country, there's a parallelism between GDP and uh, energy, con energy per worker. Uh, you need energy in order to be, uh, have productivity uh, gains. And uh, if America can, uh, the plan was America could grab uh, the Mideastern oil and uh, uh, control the oil of other countries like Venezuela and uh, prevent uh, other countries from having the energy, then you could literally turn off their lights if they did something like Venezuela's doing and trying to develop a domestic health care system and uh, uh, a socialist policy. Uh, so, and also, the oil industry is basically set up uh, offshore banking centers and uh, tax, uh, uh, tax evasion. Uh, I was a lobbyist for the oil industry for one year at Chase Manhattan. My, my job was to go over the balance of payments of uh, 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 the oil industry, and I, it was, uh, uh, I was sort of tutored by the head of Standard Oil. 
uh, and uh, under, uh, they taught me how uh, uh, the whole thing worked and why, uh, how they were able to maintain the power. So basically, there's no way politically of uh, challenging the, uh, the power of the oil industry. So American prosperity is based on pollution. You wouldn't want to end that, would you? <laughs> well, that, that, that's why the Green New Deal includes the job guarantee. So it's pie in the sky, you know. Yeah. So I think we have uh, one last question. And then, yeah. Yes. Um, hi. Um, it, I was listening to your expose about the ancient economies, and it's tempting to draw a parallel between the debt dynamics of back then of the ancient economies and today. But as we know, the monetary system is, was very different back in the day. They had commodity money, and today we have fiat money. Um, so to what extent, maybe I'm wrong, and I'd like you to uh, elaborate on this. Uh, how do you think that the monetary system uh, plays into the debt dynamics uh, to make a comparison between then and today? Uh, next month, uh, I think the uh, there's a de uh, uh, German uh, Dictionary of uh, Money and Banking that's coming out, and I, uh, I wrote the lead article on uh, the origins uh, of money. Uh, it's, uh, any, anyone who talks about commodity money is a, a right-wing uh, neo-fascist who hates labor. This is Austrian uh, theory. Uh, money, is, uh, the origins of money in every country is the same. It's what you pay debts in. Uh, it, it's what you pay taxes in. The main debts uh, were uh, the tax debts uh, in every country from uh, Babel Sumer, Babylonia, all throughout the ancient world. Uh, the uh, origins of money were uh, by uh, the temples and the palaces. The word money comes from the temple of Juno Moneta uh, in Rome, which was the uh, mint of uh, the coinage. Uh, the, uh, the theory by uh, these right-wing Austrians saying, why can't you get rid of government? Uh, anyone who talks about commodity theory hates government because they hate, unless the banks control the government. And if you don't control the government, you hate it. Uh, and their idea is, how could you have money without any government, without any temples? Who, uh, and the fact is, they pretend that money is a commodity, and it just ended up in barter, and people liked something that they could save, and it wouldn't wear out. Uh, and that's just silly. Uh, every ancient economy uh, was basically agricultural. Uh, th you had a rhythm throughout the year. You'd have planting time, uh, and you'd have harvesting time. What do you do when you planted the crops, until you, uh, uh, until you actually harvest them and do something. Well, fortunately, we know from Babylonia, we have all of the, uh, uh, the records of uh, the palaces and temples. Uh, suppose uh, uh, you're a cultivator, you're growing your crop, and you're going to have to pay some of it uh, uh, to the temples or the palace at the end, and you want to go out for a beer. Uh, you go to the ale women, uh, and you'd, they'd literally run up a tab. They had uh, a kind of chalk blackboard, and you'd run up a tab. And uh, in the uh, debt cancellation laws of Hammurabi and his followers, uh, one of uh, among when you do have a debt cancellations, if there was a drought or uh, a flood or a new king took the throne, uh, then all these debts uh, would, would be wiped out. So basically, uh, the the origins of money are credit. Uh, you didn't begin with money and move from a, uh, a, a barter economy to a money economy to a credit economy. You begin with a credit economy where everybody it, with it, mutual aid was, uh, had uh, obligations to other people. Some of these obligations are simply gift exchange. Other obligations were dowries when you'd get married. Uh, sometimes you'd need uh, help if you had a funeral and you'd have to do that. Uh, but all of these, uh, you, uh, none of these uh, uh, transactions were paid for in money. You'd, uh, you'd uh, run up a debt, and at the end of the year, you would pay, uh, if you were in just a regular person, you'd pay in grain. And uh, uh, a unit of grain was set equal by many rulers in Babylonia, equal to a shekel of silver. Silver was what was owned, uh, was uh, owed by the uh, merchants who traded 
in foreign countries, and Sumer was basically had uh, Iraq. Uh, all of its la soil was uh, deposited by river, so it was very uh, rich over the millennia. Uh, but it didn't have stone. It didn't have metal. Uh, they had the trade for that. And metal, being rare, was uh, the main prestige item because it was what rich people gave to the temple. Uh, and uh, because it was what uh, they gave to the temple, it was sort of the sign that one's a, a public spirited rich person. Uh, you, uh, grain and silver were, uh, uh, were, you, were acceptable uh, for the payments uh, to the palace and uh, for taxes. So again, taxes come first, then uh, credit uh, during the year, and finally money is the means of paying the taxes. Uh, and, uh, and country after country you'd have that. Uh, Sparta even had uh, made uh, uh, coinage out of uh, uh, iron. Uh, for transactions, because I said we don't want to go the way that the uh, the uh, oligarchic uh, countries go, and uh, uh, we don't want silver. We want uh, a society of, uh, of of equals. So uh, the whole idea of commodity money is is a myth. The money is only used uh, as a commodity for handling international payments, which is why America uh, stopped it at the Vietnam War. Uh, if, uh, every Friday, when I used to work at the Chase. Manhattan Bank, uh, the Federal Reserve would come out with its uh, gold supply reports, and we'd see the gold going down, 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 and we'd think, and uh, uh, the entire U.S. balance of payments deficit in the 1950s, 1960s, early 70s was entirely military. So we said at a certain point, America's military expansion is going to end uh, uh, the, the gold supply and drive America off gold. Uh, and that's what uh, uh, my book was all about, how America went off gold. And there were a group of us connected with Columbia University, uh, Seymour Melman, Terence McCarthy, uh, who were uh, warning that uh, the Vietnam War was, dry, was uh, driving America off gold, and, and indeed it did. Uh, and without gold, how, how would countries pay their debts? Well, without gold, the only way they could pay them was in U.S. Treasury bills in dollars, U.S. paper dollars, and uh, uh, that is uh, that meant that America can simply print or electronically create electronic money that other people would have to pay, and we produce it for nothing, and they'd have to export their surplus uh, uh, for it. Uh, that's why China and Russia and other countries uh, want to go off the gold standard, uh, want to uh, go onto the gold standard to say we don't want. Uh, if we export more to the United States than it buys from us, we don't want your treasury bills because we don't think you'll pay. Because we know that America will never pay its debts. Rich people don't pay their debts. Poor people pay the debts. Otherwise, the sheriff comes. The sheriff doesn't come for rich people. The sheriff was Obama. He does, he's not going to ask you to pay your debts if you're one of his campaign contributors, if you're one of the uh, 1%. Uh, and other countries don't want to be a part of that uh, society. And uh, they're saying, OK, uh, if you pay in gold, that means that America is going to run out of it very quickly. And without gold, how will it? fund its uh, 800 military bases all over the world? How will it be able to threaten the rest of the world? There it goes down. So that is the one uh, benefit of gold, as being a peaceful uh, metal to the extent that it constrains the American ability uh, to make other countries have their foreign exchange savings in the form of loans to the US Defense Department to uh, encircle them uh, and threaten them to enforce uh, the kind of society uh, that makes America's 1% rich. So I realize, you know, as every question that comes up is going to beget a whole new round of questions. I think we can appreciate um, uh, the, the scholarship we've been talking about today and the really deep questions that we need to kind of take on ourselves, in part through reading um, Dr. Hudson's work and also just really studying and looking at what's happening around us. And so I feel like that is, you know, that is our call for, for tonight. Read, you know, read and forgive us our debts. Let's look at our economy and what, what we need to be changing to, to once again be, be free and actually proclaim liberty uh, throughout the land. Thank you, Dr. Hudson, Reverend Dr. Theo Harris, and Dr. Nyang, and everyone for being here tonight.